now live. Uh, so welcome uh, everybody to the uh, second in a series of webinars on hot topics in Southeast Asia's tech industry. Uh, this one is about uh, fintech uh, and all the opportunities, pitfalls and latest innovations uh, across the uh, financial spectrum. Um, so I'm the host, Stephen Millward with uh, Techno Global. Uh, and our expert panelists are, uh, I'll introduce one by one. Um, I think you can see them in the same order as me. Uh, oh no, uh, this order. Uh, so first panelist is Anil Aguilar, who is the uh, president director for Indonesia and cluster lead for Vietnam at Pfizer, which uh, you know is a multinational biopharmaceutical corporation. Uh, and then we have Cecilia Chu, who's co-founder and CEO with Utrip, uh, a multi-currency travel wallet, and then we have Yang Kan, who is regional manager at Alibaba Cloud's digital intelligence business. Um, uh, so yeah, good. So we have uh, Anil with Pfizer, Cecilia with Utrip, and Yang Kan with Alibaba. So that's a good lineup. Uh, and everybody uh, who is attending, please take a look at the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of Zoom. Uh, that's where you can add in some questions at any time and uh, upvote some other questions that you fancy. And we'll ask questions uh, towards the end. We'll have plenty of time for questions too. Um, okay, so I think that's uh, everything covered at the start. Um, so uh, let's move on to the first question, if, we, if we're ready. Um, so um, why are we witnessing a slow evolution of fintech from payments to more services uh, at this time? Uh, perhaps I can start with uh, Cecilia. Sure, I'm um, really um, happy um, and grateful to be here today. So um, I think speaking from a uh, fintech startup in the region um, where uh, we truly start off with uh, payments as our core service, um, I would say um, similar to perhaps uh, most other fintechs, uh, the way we see uh, payments, it's truly not the ends. It's only a means to the ends. Uh, we like to uh, start with payments uh, within financial services because um, you know, it has one of the most uh, highest uh, frequency use case. So it actually creates stickiness in the products and also um, it allows us to learn a great deal about our user base. So, you know, if I speak from a uh, fintech perspective, especially a, a payments company perspective, um, the goal is really to uh, leverage our user base and also uh, leverage what we know um, you know, around the behavior and preferences of our users and think about um, how do we use technology to harness the, um, you know, the value around the data and how do we create uh, new products across the different categories of financial services um, for, uh, you know, to be the most relevant to our consumers today. So um, I would say, you know, I think uh, even, um, I think even decades ago when any uh, fintech started, I would say the journey has always been seeing payments as the starting point. Um, but uh, frankly speaking, it's really not the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a journey for your company and some other companies, and it's about stickiness if you use payments at the beginning. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, maybe uh, how about Anil at Pfizer? Because I know you're a healthcare giant company, um, but do you have that kind of same idea with one thing would be your stickiness angle, and then you can do fintech from there. Yeah, so I'm like, uh, uh, thank, thanks for having me on this uh, platform. I'm happy to be here to do this session. Uh, and, and to your introduction, uh, we, we are a biopharma healthcare uh, company. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, healthcare, uh, to a large extent, probably hasn't used some of this technology as extensively as fintech and other industries have. Okay, and blockchain is in a space where uh, we believe there's an immense opportunity for uh, healthcare to participate in. Um, uh, we probably in the early stages, I would actually think that we're just embarking on this journey uh, of uh, uh, looking at opportunities which exist in uh, the way blockchain can be leveraged in uh, healthcare space. But, but just to give you a broad outline, uh, uh, the uh, areas where we believe there would be an uh, uh, opportunity for us to really create value using blockchain technology in healthcare. Uh, number one would be in uh, e or electronic medical records. Okay, I just okay. put this into perspective. 
uh, today, electronic medical uh, records, largely these transactions and database of electronic medical records are held in a centralized manner in some way or another with a healthcare service provider. But with a blockchain, it can probably make it much more seamless, okay? And it can actually go along with the patient transactions as against it just being a central, not necessarily an integrated uh, rich database. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a clear opportunity, which we believe will uh, live, uh, kind of release uh, an immense value okay, of every uh, electronic transaction um, and, and uh, could be leveraged for uh, uh, R&D. It can be leveraged for uh, impacting uh, patient benefits better. It can be leveraged for managing healthcare outcomes better. Uh, but we're in a very, very early stage of uh, starting to explore that area. Uh, the other two areas where we, I think there are some pilots where we are working on is uh, use, use of blockchain for uh, uh, tracking uh, supply chain. Okay, the, 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 there are some pilots which we're working on in that space. Uh, and also in uh, clinical research, you know, so uh, uh, including patient enrollment uh, mechanisms and stuff like that. So uh, there, there, there's immense opportunity to leverage this technology within a healthcare, I would assume probably in the nascent early stage of uh, uh, embarking on this journey and looking at opportunities there. Um, uh, okay. uh, I think it's also important to have uh, other platforms to be integrated and have an ecosystem of partners to start to work together to see how we can really mobilize this. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on saying why is it slow. I think, uh, uh, for instance, get, getting blockchain taken off, I think just getting a network of partners to uh, start to uh, put it together is not an easy activation. Okay, it hasn't been easy activation for other industries as well. Okay, so uh, I assume that will be the first uh, area where we need to really focus on creating those networks of uh, partnerships for us to uh, get this blockchain uh, technology to get gain traction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, so that's a journey to starting with blockchain. Okay. <laughs> Um, so how about at Alibaba Cloud? Um, what does Yang Kang feel about all the evolution in the industry? You have a lot of uh, major companies using the uh, data intelligence and the, uh, the hosting at Alibaba Cloud. So uh, what are you seeing in terms of evolution? Right. Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a great question. Uh, yeah, we do serve a lot of fintech company and then the, we ourselves uh, operate uh, quite a large fintech business as well. Uh, so when I look at the circle on the left, on the slide, uh, I see two things. Uh, one is on the B2C business and then one is the B2B business. Uh, so payment and billing, that is a typical B2C business. Uh, and then the, if, we, if I look at the rag tech or um, <clears throat> capital markets, um, that is a typical B2B business. Um, and then when I look at the B2C business, um, if a normal person, I would have a very similar uh, needs in terms of payments. I will pay my bills, I will pay my, uh, pay my merchandise, I will pay my credit cards and so on. So um, since the scenario is pretty common, uh, then the, I could definitely payments is the, is, is the scenario that can really fly. And then we, can, we have already see that. Uh, and then the, when we come into the B2B business, uh, for example, red tech or uh, capital markets, not every business customer or institutes they have uh, very similar needs. Um, different business, yeah, every every one of them are unique. So we may need to spend a lot more time to understand what, is the, what are the commonalities among all the businesses, and then what is the common scenario that we can put our resource to develop to transform. So that is uh, one aspect. Uh, and then the, but the, mm, not everything is slow um, from what I see. For example, insurance, we have really seen a lot of uh, fintech uh, insurance happening in China, for example, uh, so that more and more consumers, they buy insurances um, or from, uh, from online channels uh, with a fintech company that is happening. Um, and then the, we see money transfer from the consumer, um, from the consumer ends uh, that is also happening. Uh, and the micro loans in the lending side uh, to the consumers or the SMEs that is also happening. But uh, uh, but sorry, uh, but uh, really, what's slow is on the B two B side, and then I'm sure it will fly. Okay. But it just take time to understand what is really the point that we should get into. 
Okay, so the B2B side is more diverse, but uh, starting more slowly too, but a huge scope for growth, yeah. I guess. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, all right, uh, maybe the next question then. Um, so apart from the huge success in like payment and cross-border remittances, uh, are there any other notable ones that have really, really disrupted traditional financial services like at the moment? What are the biggest di di disruptors, do you think? Um, maybe uh, Cecilia again could go first. Um, so, you know, when, when I think about, you know, uh, success stories, and I, I guess, you know, here we are really thinking about impact, uh, perhaps scale. Right. So uh, scale of the business overall, I think, you know, uh, you know, the, when, when I think about scale and success stories, I think um, it's an interesting one um, because uh, if I compare startups with the universal banking models, right, which started decades ago, whether it's a DBS or HSBC, which, um, you know, for, for the many years, they really get the time to build a uh, universal banking model, meaning they target all segments, all, the, all products. Um, and I, I think, you know, if we compare the startups today with these, then we would say, okay, you know, on relatively, you know, that scale is quite small. But if we actually look under the hood, I think uh, what is interesting is that a lot of these uh, fintechs actually have extremely high concentrated market share within certain sub-segments, you know, such as millennials, right? So people between the age of 20 to 40 years old. Um, and I think what is significant there is that, uh, although on a broad stroke, right, if we look at the entire population, the impact of these uh, FinTech newer player looks small, but I think if we look at specific segments, then they're hugely successful. And I think if I look ahead over the next five to 10 years, uh, I would say, you know, these people within, you know, the, the millennials age range or even slightly younger, the teenagers, right, the Gen Z, I, I would say, you know, these will then actually become the most lucrative, uh, if not the most important customer segments of any financial institutions, you know, five to 10 years down the road, because then they will have entered different life stages and they will need more financial products, right? So, um, so you know, if I, if I look ahead, I would say, you know, many of these uh, fintech or newer players may look less successful, right? We may not call them success stories yet, but I truly think that these little guys are really companies to watch. Um, they will become widely successful uh, when their consumer groups, uh, you know, become more and more uh, important and require more services uh, five to year, 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So yeah, watch what millennials are doing, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, then how about uh, Anil at Pfizer? Uh, what's the biggest you know, disruption right now, do you think? I don't know if I'll call it a disruption, but I think I, I, I distinctly see that uh, uh, there's an opportunity for fintech companies to participate in the healthcare financing space. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge... Uh, uh, huge population worldwide, uh, which uh, doesn't necessarily have access to the conventional banking financial space, uh, which potentially, like what Cecilia was saying, could be a very uh, captive uh, target audience of uh, fintech companies. Okay? And uh, affordability and solving for affordability of healthcare and access of healthcare uh, is, an, is a well-known worldwide problem. And I'm not necessarily saying that uh, fintech companies can come in there or healthcare companies can partner with fintech companies and solve that problem because that's a fairly large, complex problem. But if you take it into pieces, uh, there's some part of uh, healthcare financing which needs to be solved by a state and there's some part of healthcare financing which needs to be solved through private insurance mechanisms. But there's still a large chunk of unsolved patient access, healthcare access issues uh, which are largely because of uh, uh, in, in inability of uh, 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 a tier of uh, economical uh, uh, population uh, to be able to afford in a moment of time uh, healthcare costs. Okay, and that's largely a cash flow related issue. Uh, and uh, fintech companies can potentially solve for that. Um, and uh, I've seen some forms of uh, uh, early ventures, but they started mostly from a uh, non-profit organization perspective or uh, 
uh, crowdfunding to be able to support families which are struggling with healthcare access issues. But the, I also see a commercial opportunity for uh, targeted use of uh, AI uh, to identify uh, credit worthiness of uh, uh, some sector of uh, population and see how fintech companies be able to do microfinancing there or other options to solve for affordability. Um, uh, there are some experiments which a uh, few uh, uh, companies have done in Africa uh, which have worked well, okay, but they were largely from a uh, non-profit uh, oriented uh, perspective. We are uh, doing few uh, pilots and the, one of them is uh, uh, with a startup called HelloDoc in Indonesia, okay, which uh, has also access to Gojek. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we're figuring out some ways to solve for uh, patient access and affordability and also uh, mechanics of delivery, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so there's some interesting options to explore there uh, to solve for affordability. Okay. So like crowdfunding and uh, non-governmental organizations, they've found the problem, but it's going to take businesses, do you, you, you think, to really solve it for real? Uh, and I, I think it probably will be, the way I look at it is that there's some part of, you know, uh, if I have to make it very, very simple, uh, it might sound philosophical, but there's a, some part of uh, the healthcare affordability challenge needs to be solved by a state and rest of it today is left on uh, individuals okay, uh, okay to fund for it from uh, their own pocket um, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately uh, we don't have aggregated solutions okay uh, so i i do see a potential if there's um, say ngos crowdfunding organizations or uh, uh, fintech uh, companies or microfinancing organizations plus healthcare platforms, which are digital, okay, if they come together, uh, we should be able to find some aggregated solution. Okay, so mm -hmm. it, it, I think we'll have to create an ecosystem where uh, uh, these partners come together naturally and be able to find it. And when we did this pilot with these companies in Indonesia, it wasn't an easy start as well because um, uh, the digital companies don't understand healthcare and the regulations of healthcare, et cetera and healthcare uh, industry doesn't understand technology. So it takes a while for us to bring these ecosystems together, but uh, I definitely think an aggregated solution is the route forward, yeah. Okay, okay, uh, good. Uh, we'll come back a little bit more to microfinancing and healthcare quite soon. Uh, okay, um, uh, yeah, Yankan, uh, any thoughts from you on like the biggest disruption right now? Right. Um, so uh, a couple of notable disruptions I, just, I see is that the uh, first one is the customer's, customer's expectation, and then second one is touch point. So um, as expectation, as we actually most of us should, could uh, note, notice that we actually expect right now everything is happening in real time. So if I do a money transfer, I should see my see the dollars in my account in real time. And then I do a payment, I, I will see that successfully in real time. And everything I, I want to enjoy that in the real time. So that is uh, one very big change. The second one is the touch point. So traditionally, we are used to the offline services. Like I go to the branch and then I, uh, <clears throat> I do my things in the counters. But uh, right now, um, I don't want to do that. I want to have some touch points that I can use my services anytime, any place. Um, 24 hours a day. So these are the two biggest uh, disruption to the traditional fin financial services. And then what does it mean uh, to the industry is that if, if we look at the, the touch points, actually fintech company are so into this, uh, what we call the customer operation, like how do we acquire new customers? How do we enlarge my uh, customer database? Uh, how do I create a stickiness? How do I um, make them to refer to their friends and so on? So uh, this is uh, the new thought uh, or what we call the internet thought in, in the nature of fintech uh, compared to the traditional financial services, um, then we didn't see that much of this kind of element in the traditional financial services. I think that is probably the biggest uh, disruption I see. Okay. So that covers all of the consumer side, uh, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, uh, all right, good. So I think that was a lot about the present and a bit about the future. Uh, maybe the next section we could move on to, um, which is, uh, yeah, FinTech plus healthcare. Uh, I think there's a lot of scope for growth there. And we have uh, Anil from Pfizer with us. So uh, maybe could you tell us 
um, in a bit, you know, even more detail. Uh, how does microfinancing for healthcare work, and uh, what have you done with it already, and where is it heading? Yeah, so I think you know, uh, uh, just to uh, uh, build on what has been uh, said earlier, I think uh, uh, fintech companies obviously uh, they have kind of uh, uh, found ability to create value of targeting customers way better than conventional financial institutes have been able to do in the past, right? Um, and now we, we, we in uh, healthcare also uh, find it very difficult to go direct to patients because of uh, regulatory uh, barriers. Okay, and anything which we do as a large scale campaign without having targeted uh, uh, approach uh, usually doesn't yield the same kind of result. Okay, so what we really found in this uh, time of working with a healthcare platform and the fintech uh, 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 company would be that the use of uh, AI to be able to do a lot more targeted uh, effort. Okay, uh, and and for us, I think also in healthcare we see uh, 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 data privacy. Uh, and patient uh, information uh, privacy uh, requirements a lot more regulated. Okay, uh, and uh, there there are there are ways to find uh, uh, solutions around that. So I think I touched upon it in uh, the blockchain technology could be one way to solve for it. Okay, uh, uh, and then the, the question would come: uh, Who would own the data today? Uh, 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 healthcare data is held centrally either by the people who provide healthcare services or by research institutes in uh, some form or another. Okay, but if you take it to a blockchain technology, then uh, potentially it might become sovereign data of uh, an individual. Okay, and the uh, mm -hmm. individual probably will be able to uh, 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 provide consent to where the data would be appropriately used. Okay, and uh, in a way, it could potentially even become uh, uh, Bitcoin, okay. <laughs> every transaction could be in Bitcoin. Every data point could be in Bitcoin, okay. So there, 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 there's some opportunities for us to look at uh, it from that perspective. But coming specifically to your question on uh, uh, the fintech model which we use, it's not really a fintech model, but uh, the platform which we used was actually a tie-up between uh, and healthcare service providers, uh, 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 health organization which is a social organization. Uh, uh, plus a uh, healthcare platform, which is digital, Allodoc, okay? uh, and Gojek, which has uh, got a huge consumer base and has an immense potential to do uh, 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 targeted uh, AI work, but uh, also uh, has an ability to manage payments. Okay? Uh, so uh, bringing all this together to be able to uh, find an affordability solution is what we're trying with uh, 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 this program in Indonesia. Okay, but we're trying multiple other programs across uh, uh, the world to see how we can solve for that. Um, I, I, I also see, I, I think I haven't touched upon that in my earlier comments, but blockchain can also potentially address uh, much more transparency if we bring it to the supply organization to uh, uh, address the counterfeiting issue which exists in uh, healthcare as well. Okay. It might not be something which is an opportunity for fintech companies or other companies to participate in. Okay, but I think it also addresses some fundamental issues which we have in conventional uh, mechanics of healthcare. Okay, so it might be an uh, opportunity for digital companies to create that value of saying a blockchain driven data mechanism and the network potentially will solve for some of the evils which exist in uh, uh, our physical mechanics of uh, healthcare delivery. Okay. Uh, one follow-up question so that we have a, a good concrete um, idea uh, of what's happening already. Uh, what have you been doing with HelloDoc and Gojek in Indonesia? So we, we, we've launched a digital uh, patient access program without going into too much detail because this is not about the product uh, itself, but uh, uh, it primarily is in, uh, a platform through which uh, a patient should uh, be able to uh, enroll onto a program, be able to uh, uh, consult with a specialist, uh, get a special affordable access uh, plan, 
uh, be able to have the uh, product delivered because Gojek is also involved in the delivery mechanism. Okay, uh, and also adhere to the treatment and be able to get patient dedication material, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fully comprehensive linked up plan. And that's the reason I said it's an aggregated solution because we have a digital plat uh, partner, a healthcare partner, we have a delivery partner like Gojek and a payment partner also. Okay, uh, and we also have an, uh, uh, an institute which is a healthcare institute, which is a non-profit institute which ensures that patient uh, is kept in the center of this whole uh, process. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah, good. So that's a good crossover of uh, healthcare, fintech, plus transport. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so how about on Alibaba Cloud side? Um, how does Yankam feel about crossovers there? For example, maybe you'd be thinking crossovers like fraud management, uh, credit scoring, uh, compliance, is that right? Uh, yeah, so since I'm from Alibaba Cloud, which is a cloud company, I would I'll probably bring up the crossover to see that uh, what does fintech to do with cloud. Uh, so mm -hmm. definitely what we have seen in the market is that every fintech company are leveraging cloud uh, because that uh, um, the fintech company will give um, will provide the customer trustable services and then the clouds, uh, na the nature of cloud, which is uh, uh, elastic and then the, uh, and the pay as you go and then the a platform as a service uh, provide the best, uh, best place uh, to host uh, the fintech uh, applications. Uh, and then another side of cloud is that uh, uh, for the data intelligence platforms, um, which is the, as we know that the data is, is a raw material for artificial intelligence. Uh, so the, uh, the big data platform is quite important for any of the application, for example, fraud management, credit scoring, EKYC and, and things like that. So uh, with the cloud's uh, data intelligence platform, then the, it is uh, kind of a jumpstart for fintech companies to get on board and then the start to accumulate the data assets to the, to, to the organization. And then the, so that we can create more, uh, more data product, for example, credit scoring. That is what we see, uh, that is what we ourselves has been done on the CSME credit, that is a data product based on our uh, data assets. Uh, and then fraud management, that is a similar thing. Um, so uh, what I see is that uh, a fintech company has, uh, in nature, uh, will have a lot of connections with cloud, with artificial intelligence, and then the big data platforms. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned Sesame Credit. Is that a, a good example of what we can see more of in the years ahead? We, uh, and for those who don't know, it's like a China-oriented service from Alipay, right? And then you can yes. get... Um, I think maybe loans, but you can tell us more. But, uh, so Sesame right. Credit, is, is that a good model? Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting data product. Uh, so what we do is that uh, um, it actually starts with our e-commerce uh, needs. So when we do e-commerce needs, people need to trust, uh, the buyer needs to trust the seller, they need to trust each other. And then the, um, and then the Sesame Credit is something that we want to give people a credit score. Uh, and then this credit score is determined by their behavior. Uh, of, for example, transactions and then behavior in terms of uh, what they do in the e-commerce space uh, so that we um, put that into a score so that uh, people can trust each other better. Um, and then the people will try their best to improve their credit scores. And then the, when our business is getting um, more and more into more and more space, for example, local services or even the live video streaming kind of businesses, then we have more and more data points to enrich uh, the credit scores, which is the CSME credits. Uh, so right now it is actually adopted not only in our ecosystem, it is actually adopted in a lot of uh, no matter offline business or in our daily lives in China. Okay, okay. It's, it's not too different from the old fashioned credit scores, I guess, so, you know, that, that have been around for decades. Uh, right. But it's more, more data driven maybe. Right. Uh, so what the key difference is about probably we use a lot of uh, uh, alternative data. Uh, traditionally, if we do the credit bureau kind of credit scoring, we have a, uh, that, uh, a fixed list of data that we use and then the, the, the fixed model that we use. But uh, um, we are trying to be innovative and then the, we're trying to um, make something, something uh, enhanced or richer. So we leverage a lot of uh, alternative data to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right. That just means like uh, are people are so using services or something. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, Anil, you have a point too. Yeah. So no, it's interesting that the conversation went into that area, and uh, I, I had an interesting conversation with uh, one of the fintech companies, which is looking at the microfinancing and uh, uh, across Europe and Asia. Uh, uh, and largely in emerging markets. Um, uh, and uh, uh, while it seems like uh, they're trying to mimic what is there in the financial conventional space of uh, credit rating, uh, the sources of inputs okay, makes the big difference. Okay? Uh, in a banking system, it's purely uh, the database of your uh, banking transactions. Okay? Uh, but what these companies are really uh, looking at is multiple sources of uh, data. To not really, you know, I, I like this trust part, which I think uh, you spoke about. Okay, uh, they, they given a reliability rating, which is uh, what is the potential of default. Okay, which is the most important in microfinancing. Okay, as against giving a credit rating, which says, okay, this guy can take five thousand dollars or two thousand dollars of a loan. Okay, uh, they they have a. Uh, the, rating which talks about the reliability and which I found it very interesting. And that's, that's when I said there's a fantastic opportunity for a micro, a microfinancing company like that, which has that kind of a capability to partner with a healthcare service provider or a pharma company to solve for um, uh, many people who potentially need the cash flow in a very short period of time, but they don't have access to conventional banking and financial uh, loans. Okay, but if you have a reliable uh, rating mechanism, okay, which uh, reduces the potential NPAs in uh, those microfinancing uh, uh, opportunities, it really takes. I, so I think what what I really found it different was that they were not using conventional data sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So I think we're talking about uh, unusual data sources, like for example. <clears throat> Maybe somebody who takes less than one minute to fill in the form, that could be fraudulent, or somebody who applies at 3 a.m. local time, then that could be uh, you know, a bot or something like that. Um, okay. Okay, good. I'm not going to give so, away uh, uh, their formula. I don't know the formula either, but I think yeah. it's a combination yeah. of uh, what you're saying, plus they also do some kind of psychometric uh, question in the way they do the enrollment of the individual. Okay, mm -hmm. And uh, they, they have their mechanics to... Uh, have some kind of predictive validity of uh, saying that you know if uh, uh, these are the five inputs which come together in this particular uh, manner, we can reliably say that uh, this person would be in uh, grade four and uh, their default rates will be X amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, okay. So we've heard about lots of crossovers on fintech there. Um, how about from Cecilia? Any uh, kind of crossovers or in the multi-currency and cross-border areas? Yeah, so uh, when I think about uh, crossover and also potential partnerships, uh, I would say, you know, the first wave of uh, fintech collaboration, um, you know, it's uh, mostly around fintech with perhaps a financial service provider, but I would really see that the second phase is truly happening right now. Like what uh, Anu has, has mentioned, you know, how a pharma company actually is, you know, working with tech giants like Gojek and so forth. Um, you know, where I see this is, you know, for example, for ourselves, uh, when we first started uh, back in 2016, four years ago, you know, as a fintech company, you can imagine the kind of uh, conversations, you know, partnership conversations that we could have with banks, you know, um, other payments companies, uh, tech companies, or general corporates, right? Whether it's healthcare, whether it's general retail, hospital, um, you know, uh, hotel and so forth. You can imagine that kind of uh, conversations really go a wide range. Um, but I would say, you know, if I were to uh, summarize, I think the value of FinTech was first uh, most, um, most understood, I would say, most, you know, most understood by financial company themselves, I would say, you know, three, four years back. Um, because, you know, using digital technology is really about delivering a service uh, for the end consumer a lot faster and cheaper. So I think a lot of fintech, uh, even ourselves, you know, when we first started, uh, we are truly a um, tech enabler, right, for some of our partners. Uh, in Singapore, we launched with EasyLink, uh, which is a uh, local travel um, transport payments uh, network uh, provider. So, you know, to EasyLink, we are essentially a partner in their 
uh, digital transformation journey. Um, but fintechs will uh, grow up ourselves too. So, you know, in the recent uh, two years, you know, we also have grown up, you know, we scale our team, we collected a, a number of licenses, you know, procure all the uh, licenses so that we actually now own our licensing and infrastructure end to end. And they will allow us to actually enter phase two, right? The second wave of collaborations where we are now, you know, in the position to actually speak with airlines, you know, uh, hotel groups, or even general shopping malls or retail partners where we can now have newer uh, crossover products uh, to truly innovate something new uh, for the consumer. So um, I almost see this as, as an evolution in the industry where when we first started out, I think most of the banks are, uh, I guess, more in tune with the value that a FinTech could potentially brain. Um, but I would say now, you know, conversations and market sentiments has truly evolved a lot. I think now the potential for us to partner with more, uh, you know, more diverse set of corporates is really here. So we are actually quite excited about what, what we can do, you know, over the next uh, few years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Okay, so like a growth stage startup, you're saying like, uh, you know, call me maybe, you know, when you're talking to the tech giants and uh, any of the giants. That's good. Oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good. definitely moving from a, a, a more diverse set of crossovers. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely see that happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good, good, thank you. Um, I think the next section, uh, we, let's move on to the next section before we can go to the Q&As. Um, so thinking like beyond the virus situation, which will, you know, hopefully be fading away soon. Uh, will the pandemic change the fintech industry in some way uh, once it's over? Uh, maybe you have some observations from your own company about you know, how it could change. Um, possibly let's start back again with uh, Cecilia. Sure. So um, I think given the, uh, given the pandemic situation, I think there are two um, observations perhaps I can share. Uh, one is from a consumer customer standpoint, I think the digital adoption in doing any kind of transactions has obviously uh, moving online and digital, you know, this has surely given us very strong boost during this time. So obviously in our platform, we do see our e-commerce payments actually grow at least 20% on a month to month basis. So, um, you know, people are certainly moving online. Um, but I will also say from a FinTech industry uh, perspective, we are actually quite excited. Um, I think over the last two years, there are lots of, um, you know, many, many kind of uh, small uh, new emerging companies, you know, very small startups trying all sort of different things. I would say the market is actually uh, quite crowded over the last two years. Lots of, you know, new, uh, new ideas, new, new companies. Um, but I think what is going forward, uh, why it is exciting for us is because I think with the kind of uh, pandemic happening, I think, uh, I think we will be able to see more focused efforts. Uh, more concentrated and consolidated uh, potentially market share because with lesser number of companies and uh, you know given the current financial climate uh, I would also expect uh, all these fintechs uh, being a lot more uh, financially disciplined as well which essentially give rise to a stronger company when we come out of the crisis so uh, personally I'm quite excited about where the fintech industry is, is trending uh, going forward. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, maybe moving on to uh, Yang Khan at Alibaba Cloud. Uh, any thoughts on post virus? Right. Uh, so after COVID nineteen, actually during COVID nineteen, uh, we see a lot of businesses are seeking for their business continuity plans. Uh, and then the one of the most important the business continuity plan is to have their online channel. Uh, and then the, uh, after COVID-19, we see that becomes a must have uh, instead of just the innovation. So those opens up a lot of opportunities. Uh, actually, um, of course, in retail, customer is looking at omni-channel marketing, omni-channel transactions and so on. And then there are various type of marketing um, <clears throat> tactics. For example, the, the right now, the live marketing, you do the live show and people will buy millions, billions of products. Uh, that is happening right now. Uh, and then the, there is a flash sale, there is a group deal, and then there is a social referral uh, marketing tactics happening. So um, those, those are going to fly. 
Uh, and then the coming back to the financial institutes, um, so or fintech companies. Uh, actually, we um, we are actually approached um, by quite a few financial institutes as well. Uh, they are looking for advices from us. On how are they going to transform that into omni channel? So um, to have their online channels while keeping their offline channels, and then the having customer have a unified experience of whether they go to online or offline or a mixed way. So this is definitely a very big opportunity that we have already seen and that we are very excited to work on. Okay. Okay, um, okay that, that makes sense too. Okay. Um, and how about uh, Anil? Uh, uh, what are you seeing or thinking for post-virus? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for me, I, I'm, I'm not too sure about how this directly impacts uh, fintech uh, context, but uh, to uh, 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 the comments from Cecilia as well, uh, we we definitely think that the physical uh, flow of patients towards clinics and uh, hospitals will potentially be held back. Uh, uh, people will prefer to uh, consult uh, online, okay, as far as possible, okay. So uh, people will prefer to uh, uh, not have physical contact with the uh, 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 healthcare service provider, okay, uh, as much as possible. But you know, you can't completely take it out. So uh, in, in the past, I think uh, telemedicine and uh, healthcare uh, platforms, unfortunately, did not get too much traction, okay, uh, and two, they were also bound with a lot of regulatory constraints from the government, okay. Uh, so for me, I think I see two things happening here post-COVID. One is uh, individuals will prefer to want to gravitate towards some digital platforms, okay. So that flow will change and people, all of us, will all prefer, if, if we have a cough and cold, we used to run to a GP in the past, but if we have a cough and cold today, we probably would like to uh, consult with somebody online as against onto a GP, right? Uh, so uh, that that behavior is de definitely going to change. Uh, and two, because this whole process has brought uh, healthcare to the fore uh, and finding innovative ways to deal with healthcare to the core, even in the government's eyes, I would believe that the government should also find innovative regulations to bring telemedicine and healthcare platforms, which are digital platforms, into the play much earlier than what would have happened otherwise. Okay, uh, so uh, with those two coming in, I'm sure that payments will also have to happen online, and that's where fintech companies will come into the play. Yeah. Uh, okay, so telemedicine didn't really happen beforehand, you're saying, but it happened in some some forms in some countries, but it's not uh, it's it's nowhere close to the potential of what it do, okay? Uh, for several reasons, you know, it could be uh, social behavior, it could be uh, constraints of what you can get done in a uh, 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 from a diagnostic perspective to a consultation perspective to delivery mechanisms perspective, what you can get done virtually versus physically. Okay, uh, but now I think there will be a lot more keenness to uh, uh, make it work, both from society perspective and from the state perspective. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think you mentioned government help. What, uh, what would that involve? And, uh, regulations, I, I, I can see, for instance, mm -hmm. I, uh, many of the countries during the COVID period itself, uh, uh, the government's passed out regulations to ease what could be done online from a health, healthcare uh, delivery mechanism perspective. Uh, hospitals uh, by themselves have also started uh, participating in some form of telemedicine, not uh, a very sophisticated digital platform, but whatever platforms they had, okay, they were trying to leverage them to, to their best. Okay, so I think it, it will give an immense opportunity for uh, companies and startups uh, which have invested in uh, creating healthcare telemedicine delivery mechanism platforms really take off from here okay and that that's what i really see and i think it comes to the fore okay will it uh, 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 happen overnight i'm not too sure okay but it will definitely happen uh, post covid yeah. okay okay thank you um okay i think now might be the perfect time to jump to the q a tab um <clears throat> excuse me um 
Uh, I guess we should start with the most upvoted one. Um, uh, so e-wallets like Alipay and WeChat Pay have been widely adopted in China. Uh, apart from providing monetary incentives for consumers to adopt payments from the onset, what should e-wallets providers do to sustain continuous usage? Uh, given that more and more e-wallet services are coming on board, um, yeah, that, that's true. There are a lot of uh, rivals in Indonesia. There are, how many companies in Indonesia have like the uh, wallet license? Uh, I think it's like a, a couple of dozen. Um, okay, so um, how about, I know uh, Yang Khan is at Alibaba Cloud, not at <clears throat> and Financial, but would you like to answer first? Um, sure. So um, actually, I'll give an example about what Alipay has done. Um, so if you noticed uh, from uh, late last year, um, Alipay have, have uh, rearranged uh, the, the pages or the rankings of the elements in Alipay. Um, so it is actually getting to the diversified uh, services um, aside from the traditional financial services. Uh, so Alipay introduced uh, the, um, the business on the local services, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> food delivery, that's a typical one. And then you can arrange for the plumbers to go to somebody's house and then um, provide a uh, repairing services. And then that could be another good example. And so <clears throat> with these local services, um, there will be more stickiness to be created. Uh, and then also <clears throat> uh, we are getting into the, um, the, for example, the smart tourism, smart hotel, but after during this COVID-19, things are getting slower, but uh, we are getting into this as well so that uh, to find out more scenarios, which is relevant to payments, but adding more convenience or values to the consumers. So that is something that uh, uh, we are already getting into. And then that has been proven that uh, increases the stickiness a lot. Um, so that is uh, what we do with Alipay. Uh, on, uh, to sustain the continuous uh, usage, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so local services, okay. Uh, I, th I think we've seen Grab and Gojek do both, so that's the, uh, that's the super app strategy, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Yeah, super um, app uh, is, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. super app is, uh, uh, thank you for bringing that up, uh, super app is kind of a uh, good way to go because uh, nobody wants to in install a thousand of apps in their phones. Um, but uh, we do have uh, more than a thousand services. So what do we do? And then the, the super apps have traffic um, and then the onboard on the super apps and then create mini programs. That is, uh, that is something that we have seen a lot of uh, cases happening. Okay. okay. Um, I've interviewed Cecilia before and uh, I know she's talked about, um, you know, uh, a multitude of services and that could be how you know a startup builds their company um, so do you have any thoughts on uh, you know holding on to e-payment users yeah so uh, you know I, I think it's interesting where you know in a question itself it says uh, a lot of uh, wallets provide uh, monetary incentives uh, for consumers to adopt uh, meaning you know either you need to give a promotion for people to actually transact with you uh, or you know perhaps a lot of uh, upfront incentives for people to download the, the app. Um, actually for us uh, at, uh, you know, for us as Utrip, actually we didn't uh, give a lot of uh, free money per se. Uh, people naturally want to use our service uh, because we provide the savings around all the uh, foreign currency transactions, right? So as compared to your normal uh, credit and debit card, you can save at least 3% for every single transaction. And we provide this consistently as a valid proposition. So um, you know, where I want to add is that uh, we are not necessarily, you know, just providing the monetary, uh, you know, free money per se, but uh, we are actually delivering a cheaper service uh, and more real time to uh, Yang Khan's point earlier, uh, a cheaper and more real time service at a substantially lower cost structure. So we can actually do it sustainably. I don't see payments as our loss leader. Uh, it is actually a sustainable uh, business uh, by itself. Um, but of course, on top of it, in order to gain additional wallet, uh, you know, share of wallet uh, of among our users, then we need to diversify our line of uh, financial businesses. So, you know, some ways that we thought about be, uh, doing, um, and because as a startup, so we are more flexible and uh, potentially more, more nimble, uh, we use a lot of partnerships. So, you know, again, initially, we 
uh, in the eZenning partnership uh, in Singapore, a lot of our users actually use the U-Trip card domestically when they ride the bus, when they ride the train. Um, in Thailand, we also partner with Kazakhon Bank. So besides payment and Forex, you know, we are really you know, co-developing with them over a wider range of services, whether it's insurance and other things that we can provide in the, in the country through the partnership. So I think as a, you know, as, as a fintech, um, our goal uh, obviously is to, uh, you know, tackle more of the financial needs of, of the person on our platform. And uh, yes, uh, certainly more than just uh, providing monetary incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, good. So yeah, that's your different way of keeping e-payment users. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I can see the next question on the Q&A tab, which, uh, uh, ooh, yeah, it's quite convenient because we can get, um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's about healthcare. So that's convenient. We can get uh, Anil to answer this one first, I guess. Uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge to blockchain adoption in healthcare? Um, well, yeah, like, uh, like, Anil, like, what, like, like what I started by saying, I think we're in an early stage yeah. of really looking at the, the opportunity of uh, blockchain uh, technology usage in healthcare. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's a distinct uh, barrier from that perspective, but uh, the way I would look at it is that uh, for uh, any of these potential opportunities to be truly leveraged, uh, we need a network of partners to come together uh, to make that happen. Okay, so I think that would be potentially some kind of a rate limiting factor to be able to, how quickly can you get those network of partners together? Uh, and two, um, healthcare data is also uh, highly regulated. Okay, uh, the governments regulate uh, who can have access to uh, uh, patient data, what form of data is uh, available at what stage. Uh, uh, research related data, uh, which organizations can have access to it and which organizations cannot have access to it. Okay, so there's some level of uh, uh, play which eventually we'll have to cross the barrier of talking to the states and the governments to get them to see the value of creating a richer database than our conventional mechanism through blockchain. So that, that potentially could also be a barrier which we need to cross as we uh, get there, but I don't think there's a distinct barrier which is holding us back. It's uh, 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 more of the fact that we're in an early stage of exploring this option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's early. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, okay. Um, I th yeah. We've got time for an another question. Um, <clears throat> so here's one with, uh, with cyber fraud on the rise. Are you seeing higher adoption of EKYC solutions? Um, I think those are just anti-fraud solutions. Um, uh, uh, Khan at Alibaba Cloud can tell us more clearly. Yeah, sure. Um, so regarding to EKYC, um, yeah, sure. Um, regarding to EKYC, I don't think there is a limit about that because we always want to know our customer better. And then the, we always need to leverage more data sources to find out more insights from our customer. Um, so uh, I haven't seen any people tell me that they have done enough KYC. Uh, already. Um, so definitely um, with the cyber fraud on the rise, uh, we will see a lot of higher adoption to the EKYC. And then actually in the market, uh, there are more and more startups or companies provide the EKYC solutions, not only uh, on the on the data services, or they are providing the uh, the EKYC methodologies uh, to do that. And then the, that is not just in the in the fintech or financial industry, there there are a lot of other industries are doing this uh, um, EKYC uh, as well. So this is a big potential. And then the um, always uh, there needs to be data to be support to be uh, the EKYC needs to be supported by more data. And then that is mm -hmm. where we can work on. Okay. Okay. Well, um, all right. Um, would anybody like to choose a question from that tab rather than me just picking, uh, picking one myself? There are a few more. Um, I'm happy to answer the first one uh, if it's uh, all right with you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, please do. It says, what are the top items travelers spent using Utrip Wallet? Um, I, I love this question. So uh, during now, during Circuit Breaker, so um, 
a lot of our users actually are buying from Alibaba's uh, Taobao platform. I think everyone enjoy uh, budget shopping um, and a lot of uh, games purchase with Nintendo um, and uh, a lot of um, you know purchases from Amazon uh, in the US where they really have a very wide range of uh, merchandise. Um, but before um, before COVID, um, you know, in a let's say last year when people are heavily traveling. Um, we also see some interesting uh, market differences. So our portfolio in Singapore uh, spend the most around dining. So they spend a lot in, uh, I guess, uh, you know, restaurants. Uh, whereas you know some of our portfolios in other countries like Thailand, that they spend the most on actually shopping, uh, retail shopping. Uh, you know when they visit a store, um, you know elsewhere when they're traveling. So uh, there are some interesting trends there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's inevitably changed in the past couple of months, right? Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, uh, any others that you would fancy picking out from the Q&A tab? We've got credit risk, um, regulation, um, uh, any, anything you fancy? I find there is an interesting question about uh, how does a company decide if they should build or buy a software storage technology. Okay. Um, yeah, this is quite interesting because uh, we used to um, build um, a software by developing by the business itself or, um, or buy a commercial software. Um, but nowadays um, there is another clear option, which is cloud. So um, definitely you can subscribe or rent a, a software or storage without spending your efforts to build it or, um, or you pay a license to buy the whole software. So that is uh, um, not only the, the software, but uh, the platform of building the software if you want to have more flexibilities or even ju you just uh, rent uh, infrastructures to build, uh, to, to build uh, the platform or software as well. So um, yeah, I think uh, that is, uh, the third option and how company decide is really to evaluate the cost and return on investments. Okay. Does this apply equally to fintech companies or any special cases yeah. for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, we have already seen that the fintech company are naturally using cloud uh, on this uh, 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 on this part because uh, it um, because fintech company normally as a startup. Uh, nobody wants to spend a million dollars to 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 buy a software upfront. Uh, so um, adopting a cloud is a natural choice. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. That, that's good. Um, any final call on the questions, or I guess we should wrap it up after an hour. How do you all feel? Anything else to grab? Um, no? Okay, there, was a, okay. there was a question specifically yeah. on uh, uh, healthcare to uh, Cecilia and me. Okay, um, uh, okay. like uh, health, it was health education. I think if I if I read it right, patient education, uh, not health education. Oh, um, right. Yeah, it says like for example, health coaching and, and things like that. Yeah, so uh, it's it's it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a complex subject. But my own personal take on it, and I'll ask Cecilia to comment. Is my own personal take on it is that. Uh, Education by itself, you know, let it be health education or uh, uh, disease management related education or patient management related education. Any form of education, I think we, what digital platforms provide as an uh, advantage over conventional education mechanisms is that it can bring continuity. Okay. And conventional because I have to be in INSEAD to learn this and I have to be with this doctor to learn this, or I have to go to so-and-so hospital site to learn this. Okay, uh, uh, Digital platforms can help you bring continuity. But the challenge has been that the reliability of which platform to go to and uh, socialization of those platforms. And I've seen that there's no uh, lack or dearth of knowledge which lies digitally on uh, health education, but uh, reliability and which source to go to uh, actually holds people back from really leveraging that uh, more effectively. Okay, mm -hmm. and maybe CCD okay. might want to add to it. Yeah. Um, I actually really agree with uh, Anu's um, 
point of view. Uh, for me, I'm really not an expert in, uh, in healthcare. Um, but if I just uh, think of it from a consumer standpoint myself, then I would fully agree what Andrew said. Um, it would be great to know which is the go-to platform that I can trust and I can use uh, often on a continuous basis. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so I fully agree. Okay. Okay, so that means trust on both like the, the coach's side and the consumer side. Okay. Uh, all right, good. Um, I think that might be a good point to wrap this all up. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much indeed to Cecilia from Utrip, to Anil from Pfizer, to Yankan from Alibaba Cloud. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you to all our uh, webinar attendees as well. Uh, we'll have another webinar for you in June. So, uh, so stay safe and uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank you, guys. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.